Hello, everybody, and welcome to Friday, <laughs> to Friday Apocryphal Podcast, your, your one-stop stop shop for everything Friday Apocryphal and podcast. And boy, do we have a show for you today, dude! I, I was about to say Milwaukee that? Atheist presents Friday Apocryphal uh, Podcast. But why? Why? It's longer. Okay. Oh. We'll we'll do that next time. No. Okay. Okay. Well, we gotta see how long we can talk. Insane. In unison, yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, like, it'd be really impressive if, like, one of us was reading out of one of these books and we still were talking in unison. Yeah, that'd be super impressive. Yeah. Uh, so, today, we are starting The Parables of Enoch. This yes, the second book of the book of Enoch. Yes. And uh, we just got done with the Book of the Watchers. I thought it was a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, this one is so so. You know, the the Book of Enoch is split into five parts, and each one comes from a different time period. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the parables of Enoch or well, the similitudes of Enoch. Well, you know, there's a part in the introduction here which right. t- talks about that. So why don't I get into it? Sure. The Book of Parables, chapters thirty-seven through seventy-one. These chapters of 1st Enoch were originally a separate Enochic writing that announced the coming of the great judgment in which God would vindicate the chosen and righteous and punish their oppressors, the kings and the mighty. The book divides into three major sections called parables or similitudes. Chapters 38 through 44, 45 through 57, 58 through 69. The term here reflects the use of biblical prophetic literature and denotes a revelatory discourse. Since the expression occurs also in 1st Enoch 1, 2 through 3 and 93, 1 and 3 Aramaic, it is less distinctive of chapters 37 through 71 than the universal scholarly designation the book of parables might indicate. In fact, The author's introduction entitles the work Enoch's Vision of Wisdom. Yes, and uh, I do have a little bit about that. Uh, So, you know, before uh, we actually get started here, I want to, uh, I think uh, Ellis got this for us. Yes. Uh, This is a commentary on the second part of First Enoch. This is from the Hermenia commentary series. Fantastic. Uh, And actually, uh, so the two guys that wrote this were Nicholsburg, and Vanderkam, and those which are the yep. two guys who wrote this. Yeah, also fr- the from Hermenia. Well, translated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was reading through the introduction, and the introduction is eighty-four pages, uh, and then they finally get into like the commentary official. Uh, okay. Well, is so there anything in the introduction you wanted to go over? Yes, before? definitely. Okay. Let's talk about a few things here. Uh, so, beginning first of all with the name. Uh, so the book of parables, the similitudes of Enoch, uh, the name originally comes from, uh, a later edition, uh, and the later edition is 68 one. That is a later Noachic interpolation from deriving from Noah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the actual name is the vision of wisdom that Enoch saw. That that that's the actual like title, by you know common, uh, by the ways that we title these books, which is usually by the first few words because they don't like come with names on them, as books nowadays nowadays do. Mm-hmm. So usually that's how a a title for a book was derived. Yeah, check kind out my of. new book. What what's your new book? New it book. doesn't have a title. What are you guys talking oh, about? Oh okay. Oh great. Um. <laughs> Anyway, it's kind of like the Psalms where uh, the Hebrew version includes the first uh, verse as that little introductory title. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the manuscripts, uh, they, they use like a whole bunch of manuscripts, actually. Uh, I mean, like a lot. There is like a two or three dozen manuscripts that they used for this translation, but they primarily favored uh, two of them. Uh, yes, there it is. It is yeah, they is comment on a Greek and an Ethiopic manuscript in the footnotes in here a yeah. lot. Here, 
if you can uh, pull up my screen, Chris. Sure thing. Yes. Right there is an enormous amount of manuscripts. Now, the interesting part about this is, so first Enoch does appear in Qumran, but the interesting part is that the parables of Enoch do not appear in Qumran. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, so, let's talk about the, the date of it a little bit. Uh, so, the dates range from the Hasmonean period to the 3rd century CE, uh, but it's usually placed anywhere between 40 BCE and the early to mid 1st century. And we can CE. generally conclude that it's later than some of the other ones because it's not in Qumran. Uh, that is a reason, yes. Uh, but the thing is, it is uh, it is kind of difficult to really have a precise date on this. Uh, some of the people that dated it from 167 to 164 BCE use uh, stuff from chapter 46, 47, and 71, uh, and how they echo uh, Daniel 7 about the uh, about how things were going on at that time, the Maccabean revolts, mm -hmm. um, then they usually use that for dating. But there, there are some problems here. So the initial problem is that there's no survey of Israel's history. And a lot of these works that we can date usually survey the history of the people in some way. And it does help us place it. Uh, for, for example, the Books of Kings, uh, yeah. that, that contains very uh, discreet historical information that we can pl we can place it in history they even cite their sources <laughs> <laughs> technically yeah uh, we don't have those sources though so it doesn't help us yeah there's a there's lack of a so kind of bouncing off that there's a lack of datable allusions to historical events um but some of them that we will go over later uh for example chapter 56 it might be about the invasion of of uh, Palestine by uh, the Parthians and the Medes. Uh, chapter 67 could be a reference to Herod the Great and attempts to be healed in the Baths of Kali Ro. I don't know what that is. The but Baths of Kali Ro? Yes. What? Um, uh, that sounds like, wait, what did, does it say what the intent of these baths are? Uh, to, to heal. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, so they're not Lazarus pits per se, but they're healing like, how do you Thanks. spell Kali Ro? Uh, K A L L I R R H O E. Uh, so the thing is, he does have. Uh, once we get to that chapter, he does have a very long discourse on that, which I will uh, get into. Uh, then, furthermore, uh, the parables are lacking at Qumran, which means that the parables, you know, some scholars have taken that to mean that the parables were written uh, post-68 CE because that's when the caves were, like, closed up. Um, there's a dispute between the Son of Man theology. Uh, so it's hard to determine if the Son of Man uh, theology in apocalyptic Judaism is the same as, you know, you know closer to, to the time of Jesus. They're, you know, very late... No, I wouldn't say it's not very late Judaism, but, you know, that kind of Judaism or early Christianity, it's hard to tell if those are, if that's the same theology. Mm -hmm. uh, and also there are uh, parallels with other Jewish literature and whether or not uh, that actually helps us determine a date. So there are quite a few problems. Um, but there, there's, you know, some very interesting stuff about this book. For example... Or about this section. For example, there's no reference to Mosaic Covenant, Torah, temple or priesthood issues, or matters of purity, which is very weird. Yeah. I looked up the Baths of Kali Ro. All I can really find in a quick search is that they were supposed to be magical medicinal springs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also, like some of the identifiers that are used in this, for example, you know the the chosen and the righteous, they're never identified, so it's it's very it's very hard to to figure all this stuff out. Uh, one of the neat things I found is there was a, a nice little theological contradiction. So, um, according to um, chapter thirty nine, the the souls, uh, you know, in the in the time of judgment, they will come, uh, they they were resting um, in heaven. Right, but at the time, but then in uh, chapters fifty-one and sixty-one, uh, the 
souls will come from Shoal. Well, that would be in line with the explanation that we were given in the Book of the Watchers. It will, yeah. 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 Um, I don't recall, unless they're referring to heaven as that luminous uh, pit that has the fountain. Yeah, but I, I don't think it was ever described that way. No, uh, I, I don't yes, think so either. It's coffee. Yeah. Yeah, this is coffee. Uh, also, live chat that, Chris. What's that? It's on top chat. Live chat. Oh, yeah. Why Oof. is that? Because you refresh the page. Um, I get you. Gross. Yeah. So there is uh, quite a lot. So the manuscripts that they're talking about, uh, the manuscripts that they're using uh, are uh, primarily are in uh, Ethiopic, Gez. Um, and they're from uh, Aramaic originals that they argue. Um, there is a little bit more in here uh, that I want to get into uh, after you go over what you... Sure, yeah, I, got, I just got one more thing. So the, the textual favor is generally given to... Uh, I'm not sure if this is supposed to pronounce Jana or Yana, uh, but it's uh, spelled J-A-N-A 9. That's the manuscript. And then E-M-M-L 2080. And those are both 15th century manuscripts. But that's where uh, they give textual favor to. Are there a lot of um, medieval manuscripts? Oh, yeah, quite a few. Yeah, I would imagine that the um, kind of Heckelot literature, which, I mean, the Book of the Watchers is... Yeah, the thing is, all of this stuff comes from... Uh, so the, the, the ones that, are he, that he's using, it, they're pretty early in comparison. They're from, you know, the 15th century. But most of these are from 18th, 19th century. Okay. That make well, there was probably some kind of social movement involved that increased production of these manuscripts at some point. Sure, yeah. Either that or the older ones have just been <laughs> destroyed. That is also a thing that happens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, going further into here, uh, it says, running through the parables are four major types of material three of which parallel other parts of First Enoch. The book as a whole depicts a series of journeys. The seer ascends to the heavenly throne room, then he visits the astronomical and other celestial phenomena and the places of punishment. The second set of materials includes narratives about Noah and the flood, as in chapters 6 through 10 and 106 through 107, the flood is a type of the final judgment. The third group of materials consists of heavenly tab tableau, T A B L E A U X. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, scenes tableau. I don't know. Yeah, scenes in a developing drama that depicts events leading up to the final judgments. Intermingled with these tableau is a series of anticipatory allusions to the judgment often introduced with the words, in those days. The drama depicted in the parables includes a diverse cast of characters. On the one side are God, God's heavenly entourage, the angels of divine judgment, primarily the chosen one, but also certain of God's angels, and God's people, the chosen, the righteous, and the holy. On the other side are the chief demon Azazel, his angels, and the kings and the mighty. God is usually called the Lord of Spirits, a paraphrase of the biblical title Lord of Hosts, or the Head of Days. The Chosen One combines the titles, attributes, and functions of one like a son of man in Daniel seven thirteen through 14 the servant of the Lord in 2 Isaiah, the Davidic Messiah, and the pre-existent heavenly wisdom from Proverbs 8, although Son of Man is a Semitic way of saying human being, the usage in Daniel 8, 15, 9, 21, 10, 5, 12, 6 uh, indicates that an angel can be called a slash the man or described as having the appearance of a man the Chosen One is the agent of God's judgment and as such is depicted with imagery that the early chapters of First Enoch ascribed to God. Related to his judicial function is his role as the champion of God's people, 
and his titles, the chosen one and the righteous one, correspond to the titles, the chosen and the righteous ones. The salient features of God's people are their status as God's chosen ones, their righteousness, their suffering, and their faith in God's vindication. Azazel and his hosts are the counterparts of Asael and of Shemahaza and his hosts. And their major sin here is the revelation of secrets. The king and the mighty, the real villains of the peace, deny the name of the Lord of Spirits and the heavenly world, worship idols, and oppress and persecute the righteous. And we're going to be going into stuff here, but uh, the only thing else that I really want to read from this introduction for the part that we're reading says, The first parable introduced most of the dramatic persona as well as the theme of judgment. Together with the introduction to the book in chapter 37, it follows roughly the structure of the first chapters of First Enoch. Compare chapters 37 with 1, 1 through 3, chapter 38 with 1, 3 through 9, uh, 39, 1 with chapters 6 through 11, and 39, 2 through 14, uh, 40 with chapter 14. Yeah, so, so the, the whole uh, thing about this is that, you know, you were noting how, you know, it's a, a different tradition. It's not 100% a different tradition. Uh, it's clear that they were working with probably different materials, but they also had the Book of the Watchers. Uh, so there was a significant, there's a, a significant amount of divergence from the Book of the Watchers uh, in, you know, some, uh, in some of the materials. So for example, Enoch's, uh, eschatological, eschatological visions, uh, some of the cosmological secrets and the, uh, Noah materials. Uh, and that those are some of the arguments that are used to show that this is, you know, more of a patchwork really. Um, but, uh, was really interesting and you kind of hit on it a little bit. Um, and th this is a, a little long, but I feel like it's kind of necessary to understand, you know, the mindset that we have to look through here. Uh, so the most original feature of the parables is its expansion of the cast of characters found in the older Book of the Watchers, introducing logical counterparts to the main players in the two Enochic legends, and thereby giving a socio-political application to the Watcher myth on the one hand, and a deeper mysticism to the Enoch myth on the other. Uh, so they what they end up doing is having a, you know, for all the stuff in heaven, they have a human counterpart. So there are the watchers and then there's the kings and the mighty. Uh, for, you know, a, a person for a, like, like Enoch, for example, uh, there is Enoch who is earthly, but then there is a son of man who is heavenly. Uh, so it kind of, you know, uh, as it is in heaven, so it is on earth kind of, kind of deal. As above, so, oh, so below. below. Yep. Right. Uh, does this have even more uh, ramifications? I don't uh, know. Maybe. I don't want to look into it too much before we get started, but mm. this does suggest that uh, these reoccurring archetypes are more abundant in the lore than we realized. You know, do you, here's a stupid example, but it's like convergent evolution for stories as well, I suppose. Um has any of you seen or heard of the Seinfeld episode where they run into an identical group of themselves? Like doppelgangers? I, I can imagine it. Yeah, basically they're like, can I hang out with your group? No, we already have a Chandler. Oh. Yeah, can I hang out with your group? No, I already have a Seinfeld. Sorry. Okay. It's that they had full groups, basically. You know what I mean? There's a slot for them to fit in into an archetypical sure, part sure. of the story. And I'm feeling here that, you know, these hierarchies are transferable. I mean, I, I, it's kind of similar to that. Well, there there are parallel characters, uh, like it said about the chosen one being uh, parallel to the chosen people. Right. right? Yeah. So uh, I am assuming that uh, the existence of such characters are like a story motif just to personify the entirety of a nation. Sure, I mean, the, the thing is, you know, kind of, the thing is people take pre-existing myths and mm. pre-existing ways of storytelling 
and then, you know, kind of change those to fit their context. And that has happened throughout the history of Israel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and but, when, but when I think about the chosen one coming from the chosen people, it really just seems to me like this is a stand in for a uh, generic hero of these people. Correct. Sure, sure. Uh, and the, the whole thing about the chosen one, uh, there is some debate as to whether or not... Whether they were supposed to destroy the Sith or join them? No. Uh, you th- th- were the chosen one, Anakin! <laughs> there is a debate over if uh, that is a specific person or it can just be any person. As Obi-Wan. That, is, that, is ch- that yes. was chosen. You and McGregor, Obi-Wan. Yeah. Okay, whatever. <laughs> well, why don't we get into it? Yeah, yeah. We've been going on for like 20 <laughs> minutes about an introduction to this. It's been so good. I, th- I it's think been it's good. Yeah. But uh, let's, let's do it to it. The Book of Parables, superscription and introduction. There's a footnote before we even start oh, off. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first part here of the first sentence says, The vision of wisdom that Enoch saw. They footnote it saying, All Ethiopic manuscripts... Begin with the second vision that he saw. Yes. Almost certainly a gloss that postdates the sections in corpor- t- incorporation into the corpus and relates the parables to Enoch's vision recounted in the Book of the Watchers. Yep, yep, and that that's pretty much what he argues for here. And in fact, in uh, uh, in this Hermenia commentary, it he goes into into the Hebrew and into the Greek, but it, it does basically boil down to uh, to that exact thing. Okay, so the vision of wisdom that Enoch saw, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalalel, <laughs> or Mahalalel. No, you got it right the first time, but it was. Uh, just, I added an extra L. No. Oh. <laughs> um, the son of Canaan, uh, K E N A N, yeah, Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth. The son of Adam. So this is, I think, a um, genealogy of Enoch. Yeah. Yes. It's pretty brief. Which, you know, we pointed out in the Bible itself, in Genesis, Yeah. two Enoch's origin stories, right? Were there? I'm pretty sure that they said. Oh, that right. The, that they had. Yeah. Uh, yeah two, the, he came from. Yeah, I remember that. Okay, he had two different fathers or something. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that now. Okay. So that's noteworthy, uh, but this is the Enoch we're talking about: son of Jared, son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam. Okay. This is the beginning of the words of wisdom, which I took up to recount to those who dwell on the. Earth. Well, yeah, here he actually has something on this. Uh, Enoch's genealogy reflects the uh, Sethite genealogy in Genesis 5, 4 through 9, which is presumed in uh, 93, 3, the seventh from Adam. Uh, prophetic uh, incipits normally list only the father. Exceptions are uh, Zephaniah uh, 1, 1, that's four generations, and Zechariah 1, 1, two generations. Okay. Uh, There's also a footnote here for earth. It means literally land. Sure. Listen, O ancients, and look, you who come after. The words of the Holy One, uh, many manuscripts read the Holy Words instead of the words of the Holy One, uh, which I speak in the presence of the Lord of Spirits. It is profitable to speak these things at first, and from those who come after, let us not withhold the beginning of wisdom. So set up your premises before presenting your conclusions. I guess, yeah. Until now, there had not been given from the presence of the Lord of Spirits such wisdom as I have received according to my insight, according to the good pleasure of the Lord of Spirits, by whom the lot of everlasting life was given to me. Three parables were imparted to me, and I took them up and spoke to those who dwell on the earth. Yeah, so and that's le- the end of the superscription and introduction. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about... So we're still on 34, though. Hmm? 37? 37. 
Yeah. Uh, we just finished 37. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's not very long. Um, so in the parables, wisdom uh, is – actually, I'll start from here. Uh, in First Enoch, apart from the parables, wisdom, uh, Sophia, uh, is the salvific revelation that is given to the chosen of the end time. That is identif- and that is identified with the teaching of Enoch contained in his various writings. Its custodians are, quote, the wise, uh, teachers of the end time. Uh, in the parables, wisdom is an entity that belongs to the divine realm, where it is a property of God, the Son of Man and the angels. In a pessimistic parody of Sirach 24, uh, the little poem in First Enoch 42, which we'll get to, uh, describes how wisdom, uh, which had its dwelling among the angels, descended to earth, but finding no place there, returned to heaven, leaving earth to host the presence of iniquity. We're going to have to read that book too, Sirach. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, eventually. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't have much else to say about the introduction, but I do find it interesting that in verse 4, uh, he says that the lot of everlasting life was given to him by the Lord of Spirits. <laughs> yeah, so here's a little uh, bit about that. Uh, and I've n- also never heard this word before. These two distics emphasize the uniqueness of the revelation that Enoch received from the presence of the Lord of Spirits. In the first two lines, the verb pair, quote, have not been given, and, quote, I have received, complement each other. Wisdom uh, governed by the passive form of give is a traditional way to describe the dispensing uh, slash recip- the receipt of revelation, not least Enoch's. What's that word? So it wouldn't distics? Distics, okay. Um, and someone in the audience is asking about our translation. We're using the Hermenia translation of First Enoch by George W. E. Nicholsberg and James C. Vanderkam. They're also the authors of the commentary that here yes uh the divine source here is sorry the divine source is here explicit quote from the presence of the lord of spirits could refer to enoch's ascent to the heavenly throne room or to a cultic setting that led us to or that led to the ascent to heaven uh quote until now emphasizes that enoch was the first to receive his special wisdom echoing the idea in jubilees 417 to 18 which we will also go over uh, the last words of verse 4 may indicate that, or of verse 4b, I should say, may indicate that Enoch was especially intellectually equipped to receive this revelation. This would parallel the widespread idea that his righteousness made him fit to be received into God's presence. The verb here, translated received, uh, nasa, is the same root uh, that is translated took up in verses 2b and 5b do they comment on uh the third line of verse four where he says such wisdom as i have received according to my insight uh because it said, a, it seems, said of verse four right yeah verse four is probably the most interesting bit here um he says uh until now there had not been given from the presence of the lord of spirits such wisdom as I have received according to my insight. Is he saying um, it is his insight that such wisdom has not been provided, or is uh, is there a contradiction uh, in terms here? Because if the wisdom comes from his insight, then it does not come from the Lord unless you add the additional premise that insight comes from the Lord. Sure. Uh, let me just, uh, I'm going to look through it. But uh, you can uh, continue reading. Okay. The first parable, chapters 38 through, th- through 44. The coming judgment of the wicked. The first parable. This is chapter 38. When the congregation of the righteous appears, the sinners are judged for their sins, and from the face of the earth, They are driven. So this is like a, they're going to be killed, which is kind of what happens in the Bible with uh, the so-called chosen people going into the land of Canaan and wiping out all sorts of other people. Uh, And when the righteous one 
some manuscripts read righteousness, appears in the presence of the righteous, whose chosen works depend on the Lord of spirits, and light appears to the righteous and chosen who dwell on the earth, where will be the dwelling place of the sinners, and where will be the resting place of those who have denied the Lord of spirits. It would have been better for them if they had not been born. Sure. Okay, so this judgment will result in the sinners being driven from the face of the earth and from the presence of the righteous into the darkness and flames of Sheol. Uh, it, so this, um, the book of Enoch is post-Job, right? Yes. So... Uh, is this a reference to Job, where Job talked about how it would be better if he had never been born? Uh, the thing is, yes. Yes, it is. Cool. Uh, and I actually have something pulled up from Eerdmans oh. about that. Excellent. All right, let me see if I can uh, quickly quickly find it. There's there's quite a lot here. Hey, Chris, can you help me out? Sure. Thank you. I know I was just reading about this, like just before the show. Uh, right, okay, so... Uh, it, Okay, so they talk about uh, being... Ch- uh, chapter 40 being based on uh, Job 1 through 2. But if it was... Uh, if chapter 40 was based on Job partially, then this one is also probably partially based on Job. Right. Thank you kindly. Okay. Uh, but uh, there's a little bit of a continuation here. Yeah, go into it. Yeah. Uh, so the term the sinners occurs 17 times in the parables, usually in explicit contrast to the righteous, uh, twice the chosen or the holy, and almost always in connection with their coming judgment, which is the result of their having denied the name of the Lord of spirits and oppressed the righteous. Thus, the term is generic, relating both to the deeds of, of these people and to the consequences of these deeds. The identity of the sinners is never explicit as such, but from context, sometimes parallelism, it is clear that perhaps without exception, the sinners are the kings and the mighty. All right. And so why don't I continue on? Interesting little bits here. Yeah. And the the thing is uh, in, in this commentary, he has entire, sections on uh specific words like he has uh, a section on uh the righteous and the chosen and the holy like this is yeah and it really seems like there's like a really strong black and white dichotomy that's set yeah up. yeah there's no as is tradition yeah but there's no room for error um which seems strange because it kind of defeats the entire purpose of judgment Right, yeah. <laughs> where, like, if you're being judged, it's because you know maybe there's a little wiggle room there. But uh, I mean, it seems kind of presented as if there is no such thing as wiggle room. You either do God's will or you will be. Uh, it would have been better if you were never born. Right. Yeah. That is a thing that has shifted with the identity of a judge. In our modern era, you're correct. But a judge makes judgment before anything else in older lores. Like, if you were an elder and you were to make judgment, that means that you already have uh, an idea of what you're supposed to say for that setting, and that's, that's the wisdom that you have or the knowledge that you have that's required. So most things are already prejudged before. There's no trial. There's no wiggle room. There's no question. That is the judgment, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, uh, I guess it's more in line with some of the nobleness of the nature of that, of that uh, top of the hierarchy. Yeah, but, like, you have characters like Moses. Now, Moses denies the will of God once. Yeah. Does yeah. that make him categorically a sinner who will face judgment? Uh, well, as we learn from continued reading of the Bible, no. <laughs> nope. Right. Because no, God already judged that even though one thing was bad, Moses was good. And that judgment was made like long before Moses did anything. Yeah, Moses is like a pillar of the community. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
He um, made him that regardless of his actions, basically. Yeah. So it seems strange to me that uh, they categorize these sinners in verse 2 as those who have denied the Lord of Spirits because even one denial makes you a person who has denied the Lord of Spirits. Anyways, when his hidden things are revealed to the righteous, the sinners will be judged and the wicked will be driven from the presence of the righteous and chosen. So are we again to um, equate the sinners and the wicked? Are the wicked a subset of sinners who will be? No, I, th- I think they're all meant to be the same thing. I thought they made a distinction between the sinners who sin solely by not accepting a God or whatever and the sinners who sinned. That was in Psalms, right? Well, the, uh, there was the bit in the Book of the Watchers that yeah. divided Which is people what this based off oh, of different right, 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 sins. Yeah. Right, and this is based off of the Book of the Watchers somewhat. Yeah. So yeah. I'm thinking that they're referring to those subsegmentations of Shoal. But there are cases. parts of it, uh, that, as you said through the uh, introduction and such, that uh, contradict the book of the Watchers. Yeah, yeah, correct. Okay. So we'll look out for that. And thereafter, it will not be the mighty and exalted who possess the land. There's a footnote that says, that is the land of Israel or an individual's land. Alternatively, the earth, which, you know, those are very different things. Yeah, but if they consider that the entire earth is theirs, then it's not. Right. And remember, they said something at the very beginning about what they mean by earth. They mean ground. Well, they had yeah. a fo- footnote at the beginning. Uh, yeah, it said land was yeah. just used to mean earth. I thought they said earth means ground, but whatever. Uh, please continue. Well, they it comes from the Ethiopic Yabs, which is literally <laughs> dry land. Mm-hmm. And they will not be able to look at the face of the holy, for the light of the Lord of Spirits will have appeared on the face of the holy, righteous, and chosen. So, um, holy is not capitalized. Uh, Lord of Spirits right, is. Right. So, that light that we see, I think it was in Daniel, where it talks about the face of the Lord being luminous was it in daniel i th- either that or we covered it in the book of the watchers yeah, yeah. it, it was kind of recently too. though yeah yeah um but with the light of the lord being something now that he bestows onto the holy people uh, uh sure but i'm maybe it means light in a different way yeah like the sun i mean it literally says the light of the lord of spirits will have appeared on the face of the holy after saying they will not be able to look at the face of the holy. I assume it means bright light. Um, But the holy in that context would probably be angels? Well, I I don't think so, because they're talking about sinners and the wicked, and... Well, here actually, that goes into... We're going to get a little bit more into that in 39, so... Right, but but I assume when they say holy that... uh, they mean that they're setting up a dichotomy between two different groups of people. You'll, I mean, you'll... We'll get into yeah, it. Yeah, it's literally in the next chapter. Yeah. And then the kings and mighty will perish, and they will be given into the land of the... into the hand of the righteous and holy. And from then on, no one will seek mercy for them from the Lord of Spirits, for their life will be at an end. All right, so let's uh, let's talk about uh, those last two verses for a little bit. So verse 5b appears to anticipate that the righteous will participate in the judgment of their enemies. The idea is attested in the Epistle of Enoch, which we will cover later, mm-hmm. uh, but rarely in the parables. Uh, the failure of the kings and the mighty to receive mercy in verse 6 anticipates uh, 62, 9, and 63, 1 through 11 on the impossibility of intercessory petition. Oh, right. Um, remember the, the petitions of the angels? Yeah, yeah which, uh, the whole thing. you know, ignore the petitions of the angels. Yeah. They don't get petitions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the like final line of the second stanza corresponds to the final line of the first stanza. So verse 6b and verse uh, 2f. So 
very late in verse 2. Um, While it would have been better if the kings and the mighty had not been born, since they were born, the life they received will be brought to an end. Thus, the introduction to the parable concludes by reasserting the disastrous consequences of the coming judgment of the kings and the mighty. You know, I find it noteworthy that they refer to it as a day of judgment um, because it's a little confusing, right? So uh, these angels in the book of the Watchers, they came down and then they were punished, sent to prison. They were told that, uh, you know, there's nothing that they could say that could get them out of being punished. You know, there's no point in petitioning. So it sounds like they've already been judged. That's how I phrased it earlier, is that judgment is placed early, before there is, you know what I mean? Like Sure, right but it's, now, not, it's not the day of judgment. No, that's the thing. It's the day in which judgment is enacted. The yeah, there are different kinds of judgment. judgment. Yeah. Right, and that's the kind we're referring to. Yeah, uh, so, you know, we were talking about uh, the holy ones, right? Um, so holy people are called here the righteous and the chosen and collectively the congregation of righteousness, all standard monikers in the parables. Uh, they are also known as the holy ones, a common term in the parables for both humans and angels, whereas elsewhere in Enoch, the holy ones refers almost exclusively to angels. And this is on verses four through five. Uh, and then here's a bit about the the righteous one. Uh, it's the rarest of the three names given to the Messiah in the parables, indeed owing to textual variants in the Ethiopic manuscripts. There's righteous one, righteous ones, and righteousness. Uh, and to be suspected and to suspected use of the term as a collective singular, i.e. the righteous one or any righteous person. Yeah. Uh, and I should also note that um, with literature like this, uh, when they say Messiah, they're not necessarily referring to the Christian tradition. Yeah, yeah. They're de- the thing is, this was this was either written, you know, pre Jesus or uh, without him, or as or, or, or in center. his or in his lifetime. Yeah, but there was a long history of a messianic tradition yes. or prophecy. And the and the thing is, I'm going to cover this uh, a lot because after the Constantinople video, I'm going to be doing. Uh, the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 and people take that to mean Jesus or Christians at least do that. But I'm going to see, you know, what did the Jews think of this? Uh, what was I the, I could ask a couple rabbis. Yeah, you could, or I could just have all the books that tell me what Jews think of it. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to be going into that too. I trust the rabbis more than the books. Do you? Okay then. Yeah, I trust the people who think about it to tell me what they think about it. Well, maybe it was written by someone. people who think about it. Well, maybe it was written by an atheist who is postulating what other people might think. About I have it. no idea. Ooh, they're quotations, Spooky. man. <laughs> well, anyways, I'm gonna I'm gonna read chapter thirty nine and then I'll hand it off to you. Okay, as it's it's kind of long. Uh, there's a few subsections. In yeah, it. yeah. Uh, first, the descent of the angels, chapter thirty nine. In those days, remember the previous note that we had on in those days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sons of the chosen and holy were descending from the highest heaven, and their seed was becoming one with the sons of men. This being a reference to the Book of the Watchers. Yep. In those days, Enoch received books of jealous wrath and rage and books of trepidation and consternation um so uh, all manuscripts up add what <coughs> appears to be a misplaced variant of 38 6 a yes yeah, so uh yeah. the, the two lines of this uh, distich describe respectively the books as they express god's reaction to the angel's sin and they and as they provoke a response among the angels, the Ethiopic uh, Kanat and Ma'at, oh, Ma'at, that's that's funny, mm-hmm. um, probably reproduce the Greek, and give me a moment here to read this Greek, uh, and then maybe I'll let you read the Hebrew. Uh, I am pretty sure this says Kelos and uh, Thumos, or 
orge. <laughs> uh, the equivalents of the Aramaic or Hebrew, if you want to read those. Give it your best shot. No vowels. Uh. <laughs> um, Kana'a, I think. Um, Regiz or ha- Chama. I think those are the terms. Okay. Well, see, I could be wrong. Languages. There are no vowels written. <laughs> uh, the former word uh, typically denotes God's jealous anger against Israel's faithless idolatry, and the latter, God's burning wrath against those who violate the covenant. And it's still interesting that they, the term covenant isn't even mentioned. Uh, and the, yeah, about the covenant, uh, taken together here, the word, the word pair announces the judgment that will result from God's unmitigated rage against the angelic rebels for a related word pair, fear and trembling as the watcher's reaction to their coming judgment. See Enoch, uh, or first Enoch one five or thirteen three. Okay. Next section of chapter 39, Enoch's ascent to heaven. Yes. And in those days, some manuscripts add clouds and a whirlwind snatched me up from the face of the earth and set me down within the confines of the heavens. Yeah, that's nuts. <laughs> yeah. Next section it's of chapter like, 31. Uh, it's like uh, Oz. That's how you get to Oz. The yeah, yeah, he gets taken off. So yeah. like, yeah, it's sees the real, witch flying like around. Real outside. colors. These aren't the real colors. When you get there, it's way more colorful. Mm. Uh, the dwellings of the righteous, and there I saw another vision: the dwellings of the holy ones, and the resting places of the righteous. There, my eyes saw their dwellings with his righteous angels, and their resting places with the holy ones. And they were petitioning and interceding and were praying for the sons of men. And righteousness was flowing like water before them and mercy like dew upon the earth. Thus it is among them forever and ever. The dwelling of the chosen one. And in that place, some manuscripts read, and in those days... My eyes saw the chosen one. Some manuscripts read the place of the chosen of righteousness and faith. And righteousness will be all his days. And the righteous and chosen will be without number before him forever and ever. And I saw his dwelling. Some manuscripts read their dwellings. Beneath the wings of the Lord of Spirits, and all the righteous and chosen were mighty before him like fiery lights. And their mouths were full of blessing, and their lips praised the name of the Lord of Spirits. And righteousness did not fail before him, nor did truth fail before him. Uh, There's a footnote that says, Line could be a doublet of the previous one with a translation variant of Aramaic kushta. Verbs in this verse are translated as imperfects, but could be construed as future tense. There I wished to dwell, and my spirit longed for that dwelling. There my lot had been before. For thus it had been established concerning me in the presence of the Lord of Spirits. What is going on on screen? I pushed the wrong button for two seconds. Oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah, blue screen. No, we're cool. Yeah, we're we're just fine. It's normal. (laughs) So uh, essentially the qualities that we get of the righteous angels Mm -hmm. is that they're constantly praying on behalf of humans. And... The bit that we get about the chosen one is that he's just super, super righteous and always blessing. He is super righteous. Yeah. Um, It says here, I think is noteworthy, uh, there my lot had been before. 
Uh, what what verse is that? Verse eight. Okay. I'm gonna see if I can uh, find anything on that. Because that's interesting. He's talking about the dwelling of the chosen one in this section. So, and he also says previously, ah, at, yeah, here we go in the superscription that no one else had ever received such wisdom. Yeah, so yeah, definitely. Like his lot, who? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the two parallel lines in verse uh, eight complement each other. Enoch's lot in the dwelling of the chosen one and of the chosen and righteous had been established by, a, a, this is apparently literally means in the presence of, uh, the Lord of Spirits prior to his ascent. For a probable parallel, see 37.4, uh, which is the one you just mentioned, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, here, in the context of Enoch's presence among the chosen and righteous, the notion of Lot comports well with Qumran usage, uh, where the sectarian slash righteous one uh, stands in the ranks of the angels. In our literature, the verb to confirm or establish in conjunction with lot is evidently rare and is attested only in uh, the Testament of Moses, 2-2. Does uh, it say the literal translation of the term that they're using for lot? No. Ah, uh, that's disappointing. Uh, anyways, only attested in uh, the Testament of Moses there in connection with the assignment of the land. Quote, in which the land... Uh, you shall give each of them and confirm for them a portion. Perhaps this reflects contemporary legal terminology and practice. Perhaps. That's really all he says on that. All right, there's a couple more sections of chapter 39. Enoch praises God. In those days, I praised and exalted the name of the Lord of Spirits with blessing and praise, For he has established me for blessing and praise according to the good pleasure of the Lord of Spirits. And for a long time, my eyes looked at that place, and I blessed him and praised him, saying, Blessed is he, and may he be blessed from the beginning and forever. In his presence there is no limit. He knew before the age was created what would be forever Ooh. and for th- all the generations that will be. So this, this, this is, is what I mean by his judgment is locked in. You know, he's ready yeah, to make yeah. the judgment already. Mm. He's just waiting for the things to happen. Yeah, knowing right. the, the future and stuff. Uh, it puts in the question like free will. why he would react in any. Well, yeah, free will, obviously, <laughs> but. Uh, why he would react in any way to these watchers when right, they right. do what they do because he already knew it was going to happen and why he would set aside another day of judgment when like, he already knows what the judgment's going to be. It seems like he's pushing off the judgment uh, arbitrarily. He's still resting yeah, so from that th- seven days of shit. So the only thing uh, that there's they're said on uh, verse 11. I take this verse to be part of the liturgical piece that begins with verse 10 rather than a comment on it. Uh, the third person diction is paralleled, for example, in uh, 1QM, which switches, however, to the second person in uh, line 8. Uh, verse 11a seems to summarize what follows. There is no limit to God's knowledge or end to its scope. The Ethiopian noun, uh, Mahelakt, uh can translate any one of a string of nouns that designate an end or border. Uh, and then he lists off some Greek ones. Uh, so um, with that, can you reread that first part that you just read? Uh, I take this verse to be part of the liturgical practice or liturgical, liturgical piece that begins with verse 10. So in verse 10, uh, it says, I blessed him. Verse 10c, to be more specific. Yeah, yeah. It says, I blessed him and praised him, saying, quote, blessed is he, and may he be blessed from the beginning and forever, end quote. And then says, in his presence, there is no limit. He knew, and so on, until the end of the verse. Um, So I am not sure if I agree with that, because I know that there are a lot of, shorter prayers that will get repeated a lot and like blessed is he and may he be blessed from the beginning and forever seems like it's that kind of um 
phrasing like they would use on those shorter prayers. So, like, the image that I'm getting is Enoch continually doing this individual prayer um, and being blessed afterwards. Yeah. Um, it could be that the rest is included in that as a liturgical practice, but I'm not sure. Because well, well, it would be a much longer prayer. Well, specifically then. on, uh, you know, and may he be blessed from the beginning and forever, uh, that that same uh, idea of forever uh, is echoed in 11. Yeah, but I th- I think that when you look at some of these prayers, you know, uh, blessed be his majesty forever and ever, that's usually the end of a prayer. It can be both the starter and it doesn't really matter. Mm. Well, anyways, let's get into the last section of chapter 39. Yeah. The watchers praise God. Those who sleep not bless you. And they stand in the presence of your glory. And they bless and praise and exalt, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of spirits. He fills the earth with spirits. You know, in my video on, um, I forget if it was Christian demonology or uh, another one. I think it was Christian demonology. I remarked on the um, the angels who existed to, to just sing. Praise them, yeah. the, they would literally sing holy, holy, holy and praise God. So this is in line with. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think you even mentioned the Book of the Watchers in that one. Probably. Yeah. Yes, for sure. I recall it. Yeah. And there my eyes saw all who sleep not. They stand in his presence and they bless and say, Blessed are you and blessed is the name of the Lord forever and ever. Same quote that was used in verse, verse uh, 10. Or yeah, 10, yeah. Yes. So I think that would be, you know, if it was used as a prayer... That would be the prayer. That would make sense, yeah. yeah. For my face was changed, and my face was changed for many manuscripts read until I was unable to see. And that's the end of chapter 39. All right, and before you hand it off to me, uh, so you're talking about the, uh, let's see, yes, here. Okay. Uh, when we were talking about, uh, I think it was in verse 13, uh, and there my eyes saw all who slept not, and they stand in his presence. Uh, so I'm guessing those are the same watchers that are praising him. Yes. Continually. Yes. Okay. I mean, they don't need to sleep. Yeah. They don't want sleep. Well, I, I think it actually means that they don't die. Yeah, yeah, that, that could be. Or, the, yeah, they never go down to, to Shoal or whatever. Mm. Yeah. Well, anyways, let's hand it off. Uh, fun right. stuff. And then here's also uh, Erdman's. Excellent. We are going into, and this is something that uh, you're interested in. You had remarked on at one point the archangels. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're going into. Love it. Let's uh, let's go into it. And after. And after this, I saw thousands of thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They were innumerable and incalculable who were standing in the presence of the glory of the Lord of Spirits. I looked and on the four sides of the Lord of Spirits, I saw four figures different from those who sleep not. And I learned their names because the angel who went with me and showed me all the things made their names known to me. And uh, this angel, by the way, uh, I think uh, it might be in Erdman's, or it just might be in uh, the Hermenia commentary. But uh, I think it, the one who was with him, always showing him stuff, uh, it was Penuel, right? There Maybe. were a few different ones who had spoken to him during his uh, journeys. Um, he would ask questions, like, 
and then it would say, uh, and then angel name, the holy angel of God said to me, uh, and there were a few different. Right, well, we'll actually get to it. Reference. Yeah, we'll actually get to it very shortly here. So I'll continue. Uh, and I heard the voices of those four figures uttering praise in the presence of the Lord of glory. The first voice blesses the Lord of spirits forever and ever. And this, you know, how is that not different than the guys he just talked about? Anyways, uh, uh the, and the second voice I heard blessing the chosen one and the chosen ones who depend on the land of spirits. Sorry, on the Lord of Spirits. I can't believe I said land of spirits. <laughs> um, and the third voice I heard petitioning and praying for those who dwell on the earth and interceding in the name of the Lord of Spirits. And the fourth voice I heard driving away the Satans. Adversaries. Yep. Uh, and he did not let them come before the Lord of Spirits to accuse those who dwell on the earth. And after that, I asked the angel of peace who went with me and showed me everything that is hidden. Who are these four figures that I have seen and whose words I have heard and written down? And he said to me, the first one who is merciful and long suffering is the one who says the Lord of spirits for who blesses the Lord of spirits forever yeah. and ever uh, is Michael. The second one who is in charge of every sickness and every wound of the, of the sons of men is Raphael. The one who blesses uh, the Lord, the chosen one and the ones who depend on the Lord of spirits. Yes. Uh, the third one who is in charge of every power is Gabriel. The one who prays for those who dwell on earth in charge of every power that's interesting the fourth one who is in charge of the repentance to hope of those who inherit everlasting life his name is fanuel and he's the one who fights the adversaries yeah uh these are the four angels of the lord of spirits and the voices sorry and the four voices i heard in those days do you guys uh, feel the parallels of these four with the horsemen of the apocalypse at all. One of them is responsible for all the sickness. That is where it caught me. Repentance to hope. And no, the, aside from that one. That one. Repentance. I don't know. I'm saying that they could be the. Yeah, I don't see it. Well, hear me it, out. It's on just this. the one. The parallel being not a complete parallel, but one being where they are the inverses. No, I see what you're going for. Yeah, the, uh, their aspects are the inverse of war, the inverse yeah. of famine, the inverse of 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 uh, pestilence. Right? I'm uh, just guessing. I don't know. Maybe does uh, it, it doesn't say anything about that here, and I don't think that they're parallel. Yeah. Well, um, there's four. So I will note that uh, another translation of the Lord of Spirits, which they offer here as a footnote, is the Most High God. Yeah. Mm. <coughs> Anyways, uh, chapter 41. Uh, oh, oh, hold oh, on. Yeah, sure. Go There's ahead. There's stuff we should go into. Uh, 40, verse 7, about the fourth voice. Um, it says, obviously, this section is based on Job 1 through 2. Uh, this passage pluralizes the solitary Satan of Job into a distinct class of evil spirits to be added to the spirits of the watchers and the demons as described in the book of the watchers as an individual however satan himself will also be briefly mentioned later on um, the four angels are identified by enoch's guide a certain angel of peace from isaiah 33 7 as michael Raphael, Gabriel, and Fanuel. These are the same as the four in chapters 9 through 10 of the Book of Watchers, except that Sariel has become here Fanuel, mm -hmm. a name that probably derived from Genesis 32, 30 through 31, and understood as the name of Jacob's wrestling partner. What? Yep. Yeah. In that guy. certain Samaritan traditions. Okay. This substitution is not haphazard. Sariel, too, 
is identified in early Jewish literature as the angel who renames Jacob. Um, connecting Fanuel with the angel at the Jabbok will be helpful in interpreting chapter 71 at the end of the uh, parables of Enoch. Yeah. Um, also, I was just kind of going through here. Why don't you carry sure. on Continue. while I see if there's anything really noteworthy. Sure. In the and after this, I saw all the secrets of heaven, how the kingdom is divided and how human deeds are weighed in the balance. There I saw the dwelling place of the chosen and the dwelling places of the holy ones. And my eyes saw there all the sinners who deny the name of the Lord of spirits being driven away from there. And they dragged them off and they could not remain because of the scourge that went forth from the Lord of spirits. For no angel hinders and no power is able to hinder. For the judge sees them all and judges them all in his presence. Does that have anything on judge there? Ooh, um, there is a lot of text to go through. So okay, so here's here's a little thing. So it jumps from from uh, verse two to verse nine, and uh, he says, as the manuscript stands, both uh, forty one three through eight and 41.9 are separated from the sections to which they are related. The rearrangement here seeks to remedy what appears to be a displacement. So there is a bit here. It says, verses 1 through 2 return to the subject of the judgment of which we heard last in 38, 1 through 6. Enoch sees the process of judgment weighing human deeds in a balance and the sinners being dragged off. Verse 9 continues with references to the divine judge. The section as a whole reads like a summary, with verse 2ab repeating briefly in the content of 39, 4 through 5, and verse 2c through d and verse 9, serving as an anticipatory allusion to what will be described in great detail in chapters 62 through 63. Precisely why this section was placed here and how it functions in its immediate context is unclear. In his study of Masal, Suter deals with this question in part by identifying a pattern in these verses that he finds elsewhere in the parables. A. The vision of the heavenly court. B. The secrets of the heavens. C. The kingdom, how it's divided. And D. The deeds of mankind, how are they? Wi- how they're weighed? Uh, e, the dwellings of the righteous, and F, the lot of the sinners. The fourfold repetition of the pattern, which he lists in a column. I'm not going to read out the column. Uh, it says, after presenting his data, Suter notes the pattern is used with a certain degree of flexibility, and clearly, it is not the only organizing principle in the similitudes. So there is an interesting thing going on here. Um, it further talks about the like table that he set up. Right. But that's... Yeah, I'll really continue, though. Uh, and now we are on... <laughs> You know, we are on chapter 42 now, but it's only for a moment, only for three verses. And then we're going to go back to chapter 41 because that's the displacement he was talking about. And, and I should then note, we're going to go to chapter 43. I should note here that Eerdman says about chapter 42 that uh, the Enochians stand here in sharp contrast with those Jews who believed wisdom had to be taken. Uh, Wisdom had taken up permanent abode among the people of Israel in the law and temple. Yeah, so so here, law and temple don't really matter too much because it's, it's somewhere else now. Yes, and uh, this is a poem. Yes, this is the poem that we were speaking of earlier. Yes. Uh, so just let me know when we do the shifts, please. Okay. No, we're at 42 now. Yeah. Gotcha. Wisdom did not find a place where she might dwell. So her dwelling was in the heavens. Wisdom sent forth to dwell among the sons of men, or went forth. 
uh, but she did not find a dwelling. Wisdom returned to her place and sat down in the midst of the angels. Iniquity went forth from her chambers. Those whom she did not seek, she found. What a bummer. And she dealt among them like rain in a desert and dew in a thirsty land. So she helped them all, I'm guessing. Yeah. Gave them what they needed. So, obviously, the third verse is, like, parallel to the second verse. Yeah. Yeah, it says, wisdom went forth, iniquity went forth, she did not find. Mm -hmm. Those whom she did not seek, she found. Uh, She returned to her place. She dwelt among them. She sat down like rain and dew. Um, But the commentary here says, this poem as a whole looks very much like a negative counterpart to Sirach 24, 7 through 11. In both cases, the personified wisdom's home is heaven, but she descends to earth seeking a dwelling among humans. For Ben Sirah, she becomes embodied in the Mosaic Torah and finds her home in Jerusalem. When Torah is expounded in the temple, she flourishes like the tree of life and gushes forth like the rivers that surrounded Eden, bringing life to those who adhere to her words. In 1 Enoch 42... Wisdom finds no home among humans, and when she returns to heaven, her counterpart, iniquity, descends and finds many adherents who Uh, soak up her false teachings like moisture in a desert. Gotcha, okay. It says, uh, Ben Sirah is optimistic that by means of his teaching and that of his scribal colleagues, the wisdom resident in the Torah will enable one to live the right life. Conversely, he is dubious about the validity of dreams, dream visions, divinations, and omens, which are folly and lead many astray as opposed to the Torah and its wisdom. In this respect, he seems to have in mind the apocalypticism of the Anakic writers. Some of the Anakic authors, for their part, play down the importance of Moses and his Torah, while exalting the wisdom of Enoch, and they even attribute Mosaic traditions to Enoch. Read in the light of this data, the poem can be understood as an outright attack on the notion that the Mosaic Torah embodies heavenly wisdom, and thus as a denigration of the Torah as an effective catalyst of the righteous life. Wisdom descended but found no home in the Torah or among the Jewish people, and after she returned to heaven, the Torah could promote nothing but iniquity. The corollary of this is that wisdom dwells in heaven and that one has access to it through the writings of Enoch, which embody it. This interpretation of the poem as anti-Torah polemic is particularly attractive because it is a kind of parody of Sirach 24. See, it doesn't really seem like an anti-Torah polemic to me. What it seems like is that, you know, since wisdom has left... Uh, people are now misunderstanding it. People have bastardized the Torah. Mm. Well, it says the interpretation runs up uh, against some difficulty because elsewhere the parables lack the kind of explicit polemics against false teachers that are found in the Epistle of Enoch. Uh, Middle ground may be found in the universal consensus that this poem is an Enochic fragment or a tradition that is out of place in its present context. Thus, while it appears to be tied by catchword to the verses that proceed and follow it, according to this reconstruction, and while its present location is precisely in the middle of Enochic claims to information about the judgment and order of the cosmos, the connections at both ends are loose indeed. Thus, it is possible that the poem is an intensified anti-Mosaic polemic drawn from a stratum of the Enochic tradition related to those strata that stand in tension with the Mosaic traditions. Um, And then it quotes it and says a little bit about the language. So um, I'm not going to go into depth about the linguistic pieces here, but uh, it seems like their interpretation is that this is a very strong denial of that. But if you think about it narratively, uh, the first verse here being an introduction to the two-verse poem, 
Wisdom did not find a place where she might dwell. So her dwelling was in the heavens. Mm. Um, I, I could see that, but within the timeline that they have set up, Enoch could not be referencing the Torah. These are events right. which have not yet happened to Enoch, and he's using the past tense. Sure, but then it says that wisdom went forth to dwell among the sons of men. Right, it says wisdom did not find a place where she might dwell. So oh yeah, but it's, it's still heaven. yeah, it's still pre Torah. Yeah, it, it's pre Torah at yeah. least in the narrative. Yeah, probably not in reality. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, but let's uh, let's continue here. Um, and there, my eyes, and the, we're back to forty-one now. Uh, yeah, there. This is a long, long bit. Yeah. Um. And there my eyes saw the secrets of the lightnings and the thunder and the secrets of the winds, how they divided to blow upon the earth and the secrets of the clouds and the dew. And there I saw whence they proceed (laughs) that, uh, whence they proceed in that place. And from there they saturate the dust of the earth. There I saw closed storehouses, and from them the winds are distributed, the storehouse of the hail and the winds, the storehouse of the mist and of the clouds, and its cloud abides over the earth since the beginning of the age. That sounds very similar to like a firmament kind of thing, Mm -hmm. where all the waters of heaven are. pretty funny that they have to have a storehouse. Storehouse, they got it. It's got to be somewhere. I mean... Where else do they come from? Yeah, exactly. Also, they're going to run out sometime. Yeah. You well, know, we know that s- supply. stars come from open doorways that float around somewhere east. That's yeah, absolutely true. What is it, 15 <laughs> gates or something? 12 uh, gates? I don't know. Three, quite a, quite three a few of them. And it's, a bunch uh, of it's four sets of three. So, okay. 12. Right, 12. And, you know, these are great because they're the first reference to stargates. <laughs> well, it gets better. And I saw these storehouses of the sun and the moon yeah. from which they emerge and to which they return <laughs> and their glorious return and how uh, they, sorry, and how the one is more praiseworthy, praiseworthy than the other and their splendid course. That's hilarious. Uh, and they do not leave the course and they indeed extend nor diminish their course and they keep their faith with one another according to the oath that they have sworn and first the and first the sun emerges and completes its path according to the command of the lord of spirits and his name endures forever and ever and after that i saw the invisible and visible path of the moon it completes the course of its path in that place by day and by night so this is probably um, rationalizing new moon. That's probably rationalizing... Or the uh, change yeah. of the moon Phase. over time. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, and the one is opposite the other in the presence of the Lord of Spirits, and they give praise and glory and do not rest, for their praise is rest for them. That's nice. For the sun makes many revolutions... For a blessing and a curse. And the course of the path of the moon is light to the righteous and darkness to the sinners. In the name of the Lord who distinguished between light and darkness and divided the spirits of humanity and strengthened the spirits of the righteous in the name of his righteousness. Oh boy. Oof. Got anything to say about. Uh, those astronomical secrets. Well, News to me, aside he, from he their, obviously did not have any tools with which he could make any conclusions. Yeah. So, you know, for just random guesses, great. Like, can't fault him for that. I uh, guess. But any modern reader who reads this will realize that that's not how the universe works. Like, No, it is not. N- no way. Sorry, Flat Earthers. I, I guess it detracts from the legitimacy uh, if you were to interpret it as a, like, literal... Right, yeah. Like, his- 
history or like this is how things really are. Yeah. Um, there's a bit about the winds and the division of the winds. It says here, um, uh, the division of the winds, which blow from the various points of the compass, bringing with them dew and hail and mist, is the subject of a more systematic exposition in the book of the luminaries in chapter 76. Sounds about right. And the motif of division recurs in 60, 12 through 22 on the notion of storehouses or treasuries, which are not part of the cosmology of the book of the luminaries. Uh, he has commentary on, but it is, chapters. but it is, yeah, he does, but it is part of the cosmology of Genesis. Oh, certainly. Yes. I think it fits right in. Yes. Um, it further says verse four C seems out of place. Perhaps it has been misplaced from the end of verse three, or perhaps it is a gloss with an eye towards chapter 42 whose counterpart in Sirach 24 identifies the primordial mist from Genesis 2.6 with divine wisdom. In the present context, chapter 42, wisdom is no longer on the earth, and this line interprets the Genesis 2.6 verse literally. Yes. Uh, let's, uh, let's continue, and now we're going back to chapter 43. Or I should say, we are now entering chapter 43. Oh boy. Yeah, I know, incredible. And I saw other lightnings and stars of heaven, and I saw that he called them by their names, and they listened to him. Well, hold on one second. Okay. Um, this last point is not explicit, but the passage as a whole is reminiscent of the beginning of the two-spirit section in 1QS3, thir- uh, III.13 through 26, not least with its polarity between light and darkness. Uh, the passage is striking because nowhere else in the parables is there an indication of a determinism similar to that at Qumran. And because the parables are the only section of First Enoch not represented among the Qumran fragments, the closest Enochic parable parallel to the present passage is in 108, 11 through 15, which also echoes aspects of Qumran theology. It seems best to recognize that these two Enochic passages are familiar with some form of light, darkness, righteous, sinner, dualism, but not to posit a literally uh, a literary relationship to 1QS or a historical connection to the community at Qumran or a sister community. The context of 41.8 with its references to the activity of the luminaries leads to the author of verse 8, unless the verse is an interpolation to expand his text by means of an allusion to a dualism similar to that in 1QS III IV. Uh, in addition to citing. 3 4. Yes. Well, they have actual numbers <laughs> I know. and then they have the Roman numeral okay. things. And also their I's are not capitalized, which. Weird. It's a different form of information structure. It's still valid. I looked yeah. into it, yeah. but it's definitely not one we use anymore. Or at least less frequently. Yeah. Mm, yeah. But anyways, that's a bit of theology that is present in Qumran, where they did not have the book of the parables and right. did have the other books. Yeah. So I saw a righteous balance how they are weighed according to their light, according to the breadth of their spaces and the day of their appearing. I saw how their revolution produces lightning and their revolution is according to the number of the angels. That's not how lightning works. Yeah, I I know. Also, that's not how revolutions work. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing here is how things work. Their revolution is according to the number of the angels. Is there anything on that? That, They were numberless. They could not be numbered uh, okay. in the previous. Gotcha. That's right. Parts. There were so many. Okay. Yeah. Um, and they keep their faith with one another. And I asked the angel who went with me and showed me what was hidden. What are these? That appeared in the book of the Watchers a lot. Yeah. Um, which angel is it? They. I'm looking forward here, and 
They don't give a name to this they angel. Don't. In the book of the Watchers, when they did that, they would say, and I asked the angel of the Lord X, and then angel name Y, the holy angel of the Lord said to me. right? But here we do not get the name of the angel that he's with. Presumably, it's one of the four archangels which had been pointed out or a completely different one or a completely different I think it is one. a completely different one because that angel when he was telling Enoch who the archangels are didn't say and that one who is me <laughs> is in charge of all this stuff you know he talks about them like they're not him right yes yeah so it's a different one um anyways uh and he said to me the lord of spirits has shown you a parable concerning them these are the names of the holy ones who dwell on on the earth and believe in the name of the Lord of Spirits forever and ever. Now that's the end of chapter 43. Uh, there is a little note on that. I'm going to pull this quickly up here from Erdman's. Uh, this is the only place in the, uh, in the parables, indeed in all of Enoch, where one of its images is explicitly interpreted. Uh, we, may, we may conclude that in the Enochic typology of uh, of this author, the preeminent counterpart to the righteous on earth is the starry host. And you can cross-reference Daniel 12.3. Uh, but now, this is the final chapter and the final verse. Of the first parable. Yes, because it's one verse. Uh, so, 44. And another thing I saw regarding the lightning, how stars arise and become lightning and they cannot depart from their form is that a reference to shooting stars uh maybe but also lightning i I don't know mm. okay well let me just read the commentary that they have on this verse yeah yeah do that single verse that's what we get uh this final verse of the section reprises 43 2 e the last two words are textually problematic however yeah, I bet. Um, it says note A, but it's uh, text note A. Yeah, should be um, 44-1-A. Okay, it's like abandon their form, maybe abandon with them, remain with them. A choice between the first and the third of these readings is difficult. Um so that's a linguistic problem, but moving on. As I read it, it is making the point that once the moving stars become a streak of lightning, they must stay that way. The alternative reading makes roughly the same point. When the stars become lightning flashes, they cannot remain with them, presumably the company of the stars they have left, or they become lightning flashes because they could not dwell with the other stars, suggested by Black from Enoch. Um, the author's name was Black. The yeah, yeah. title was <laughs> Enoch. The verse appears to be an afterthought. Perhaps it has been displaced from between 43, 2 and 3. It might be a later gloss. Alternatively, the reference to this lightning may be framing both this subsection and the section as a whole. Another consideration is 43.4b, the, quote, the Lord has shown you a parable, end quote. Could this be a remnant of a subscript to the parable, or might it reflect such a closing verse? The last line of the second parable and that of the third refer to the parable just completed, this is the end of the second parable, and this is the third parable of Enoch. Both quotes. Right. Um, and that's all they have to say about sure. 44. Sure. So that was the first parable of Enoch. So what did you think of the first parable of Enoch? I think they had absolutely no idea about what was happening in space. Oh, well, yeah. Not even a single clue. I, I, no, st I not still a single. think we're making a bunch of guesses. Uh, I think we They're are better. making way less guesses than this guy right here. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah, They're like not only space, but like within the atmosphere. Solar of the Earth. system and yeah. Oh, just Earth. Yeah, yeah. like General. lightning. Yeah. <laughs> Those stars, they make lightning and then they can't change. By the way, every, everything follows, you know, what God wants pretty much. It's, so it's his will. 
being frank. And, um, and you know, the, the, the whole thing, of course, most of this was about the coming judgment. Yeah, um, which I think is strange because of the heavy theme of determinism that yeah. <laughs> put forward in the first parable. Um, if determinism is true, I do not understand the purpose of judgment. It's, it just doesn't I mean, make sense. You know, when people want... Uh, when people are looking forward to a paradise, you also have to offer them not that. Yeah. Well, you know, he says outright that those who would be judged poorly, right, uh, it would be better that they had never been born. Yeah, exactly. Which, which means that God, because he knows everything that's ever going to happen and is in charge of making the rules of how these yeah. things work, is just screwing over all these people yes. and creating them for the purpose of being screwed over. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, that's... Uh, well, here's why, if you ask me. Think about it like a computer code and the way that he judges things, okay? Mm. If you think about it, he has a physical scale with things that represent good on one end of the scale and ways predetermined factors that, you know, the scale itself will judge. Yes. He's not making any judgment. He's weighing them against pre-made judgments. And therefore, there need to be representations in reality that match, in a negative sense, the things that he's not looking for so that the code, you know, has both values. These things are continuously representing their full value by praising God forever. You understand what I'm saying? They embody the aspect forever so that they can be used as a reference. Right, but the theme of determinism, like, it just makes it seem ridiculous that, well, one, you would have an entire community of holy things that never sleep, that just constantly sing praise of you because you already knew that. <laughs> well, I mean, like, they'd be like reference files. Do you get what I'm saying? They I mean, need to be there so that you know what that represents. Right, yeah, but, but they're not that within the story. They're no. very clearly conscious entities that even do things that God doesn't like. That's true. They have a place for the watchers that, you know, these are the ones they go here yeah, when the, at the, the, the end The of watchers things. aren't forever. The ones that came down right. to earth are not the ones that are singing praises. But I'm right. saying well, the they ones were. they were, but then came down not. had to yeah. deterministically do those things, and they don't represent those values as well. I, I'm I'm saying that the ones that sing forever would be the placeholder values, but I'm absolutely certain that nobody's looking at it from that perspective. Are it's you not, that's a, that's are not you guys that. telling me that a religious text contains contradictions? Uh didn't say anything. There were very clear contradictions, <laughs> yeah. I think, in that section. Yeah. Um. Anyways, uh, so that was the first parable. Next time we're going to go over the second parable, obviously. Yeah. And uh, I, like, you know, if you haven't been, if you haven't been watching Atheist Sunday School Live, you should do that because you know I, you know, the Psalms are pretty boring in comparison to other stuff. I have value, but though. But there's there's a lot of neat stuff that we can uh, we can learn from them, especially all the different translations. I'm gonna say. I enjoyed the poem from uh, chapter 42 yes, a I lot I more than, it. I, I, than most of the psalms. Yeah, yeah. I uh, liked I, uh, the, not necessarily vividness, but the extent of detail that they went into for the structure of the place they were in this time. Yeah. I, the other descriptions are not that they were 100% vague, but they left a lot out. There's, you know, in the, in the previous Watchers... Um, discussion or uh ch sections yeah yeah um anyways uh thank you ellis again yes thank you so much commentary. it's very helpful very helpful uh next week we're going to be covering the second parable and in the second parable we get a lot of son of man theology all right it's very interesting uh and there's a lot of uh you know a lot of people think that you know the the you know the messiah was you know supposed to come as a, as the son of or it's supposed to come like a son of man uh and then people reference that to Jesus all the time and like he calls himself the son of man in John uh so it's uh, a lot of 
there's a lot of theology to cover, and I am going to be reading over quite a lot of material for this ne- for the next week's show uh, because I'm very interested in that. I actually want to do a video on Daniel, John, and the Son of Man, and I guess uh, Enoch would be included in that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, Enoch is pretty in depth. We get a better view of the cosmology. Yeah, yeah. Then I think we're gonna get ever in. Yeah, the definitely. Bible. Yeah, it's pretty much the thing that's piquing my interest is the fact that the setting is finally being established from the uh, mystical or magical or divine realms and where you go when you die. And really, I don't know how much we'll ever get into in any Bible text. But at least now, because details like that are not presented, you know, it's not contradicted in the Bible, now we get a little bit of context that we can use. I mean, some of the stuff is contradicted, but... A little bit. Yeah. But most of the stuff, like... The details about lightning and revolutions well, and yeah. shooting if, stars. And if, if we consider this as a single section, its own type of canon, within these sections there is less discontinuity mm-hmm. and error. You know, I you know, whatever contradictions. I think, yeah. at least. So far, these are very straightforward for their own section. Yeah. And there's also Second Enoch, which... I don't know if we're going to get gonna into one, yeah. the, eventually. We have maybe. to for apocryphal purposes, but we don't intend on doing that right after this, right? We're doing, was it Jubilee or? Or Maccabees, or I think. Maccabees. It's either Maccabees, Jubilees, or Sirach or something Yeah, one like of those. That. And have we done a vote on that yet? No. You should. I can set that up. Yeah, put up a Twitter poll. Um, we're we're going to get more votes on the YouTube poll. Well, put up a YouTube poll. Okay. I will. Do it after the show. I will. Yep. Anyways, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, uh, check us out. Amazon wish list. Our Amazon wish list. The link is in the in the description. Facebook, Twitter, Patreon. Yes. Lot, lots of cool rewards. Yeah, you can get for one dollar a month or more. You can get all of the scripts to our stuff. You can see our patron specific content. There's a bit there. Yeah. Um. Uh. For. More money for ten dollars a month. Is there a five dollar? Well, yeah, there is a five dollar one. That's uh, you get all the books we publish. Oh yeah, all the books we publish. I forget about that yeah. one. Um, but for ten dollars a month, you get entered into our monthly T-shirt raffle, which we do on our Sunday show. Yes. And for more than that, you can appear on here. Really, yeah. go, go check out the Patreon. We got all sorts of cool yeah. stuff. And of course, on Teespring until the end. Of the year, if you use the promo code BEHOLD, you'll get 20% off. All caps? Yes. Yeah. There it is. Uh, so, yeah, if you do that, Teespring link in the description. Now would be a good time to buy all of our shirts. Yeah, be the best time, actually. Yep. It's, uh, it's the season. Well, tis the season. Yes. All right, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And, and we, we will see you on Sunday. Sunday.